Right. I think we're going to get started um, so that we can have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, so welcome uh, to the University of Miami School of Architecture's Currents Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Carrie Penabad, and I am the Associate Director of the Undergraduate Program here at the school. Now, producing this afternoon's uh, presenters, Timothy Smith and Jonathan Taylor. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our lecture series, this is one of three lecture series that we conduct at the school. We have a Technoglass lecture series, which is a thematized lecture series that we conduct each semester. We have a current lecture series that allows us to be a bit more opportunistic and engage individuals who are either um, with us uh, temporarily as part of our community as is, as is the case today, or others who are or used to travel before COVID to our shores and we hope that will happen again sometime soon. And then finally, the high noon lecture series where it really focuses on our, on our own University of Miami School of Architecture community. Uh, over two years ago, Timothy Smith, Jonathan Taylor and I began a transatlantic exchange that culminated in the current teaching position at the University of Miami as the Harrison Visiting Critics in Traditional and Classical Design. They are currently teaching this studio in collaboration with Professor Stephen Fett, a talented architect and a teacher here at the School of Architecture. The Harrison Visiting Critics Studio is made possible through the generosity of Atlanta-based architect William Harrison, and the program is currently in its fourth year, and former critics have included distinguished academics and practitioners, such as Andres Duani, Robert Levitt, and Mark Ferguson. Contemporary classical and tra traditional pr practitioners who teach and possess a critical perspective are very small in number today and those that have a genuine interest in engaging their work with the discourse of contemporary architecture are practically non-existent. In my view, this is one of the aspects that makes Smith and Taylor so unique. Both Timothy and Jonathan were trained at the Edinburgh College of Art in the late 1990s, during a time where the program had no singular pedagogical direction. And this freedom allowed them to explore architecture perhaps less dogmatically studying both the practices of leading contemporary Dutch architects of the day, as well as discovering uh, the masters such as Lutyens and the architects of the Swedish grace. This open-minded attitude towards the discipline led them in time to embrace the classical language, drawn to it through a search for holistic order and balance that is shaped principally by an interest in volume and mass. They engage with this way of thinking, both in their practice and in their teaching, not through nostalgia or sentimentality, but with criticality. And they explore classicism as an evolving language capable of responding to both the particulars of contemporary culture and construction. Since 2010, Timothy and Jonathan have taught together at the Kinston School of Art and Architecture in London, where Timothy currently serves as the course leader of the MARC architecture program. It is my understanding that their design unit is the only classical design studio currently taught in Europe today. The work of the firm has received numerous awards and has been exhibited internationally. This is the work that we hope to learn more about today. Welcome, Timothy and Jonathan. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, very kind. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And can you see that okay? Great. Um, well, uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Um, the uh, title of the lecture was supposed to be uh, Classical Translations. Um, but gremlins in the system uh, have changed it on the publicity material to classical transformations. Um, thinking about transformations as a, as a geometrical process, um, it's not a bad title either. So uh, we're <laughs> content with both. Um, we'd like to speak to you today about our position as architects who have come to classicism, uh, specifically for what it has to offer us in our own work, but also as something towards which a particular type of modernist architect um, is leaning in Europe at least we think, as architects search for an architecture of mass and historical continuity with which to counter the bland commercial neo-modernism which has come to dominate 
uh, architectural production around the world. For the first time in a long time, classicism, or perhaps rather order, is something which thoughtful modern architects are interested in engaging with, at least in theory. We have a foot in each camp, having experienced an essentially modernist education and counting many sympathetic and supportive but decidedly non-classical architects among our closest associates, but also being increasingly recognised by the established traditional architectural community for our classical teaching and design. It seems important to say that while we admire the work of many classical architects working today, um, contemporary classicists, if you will, few are truly engaged in contemporary architectural debate. Often the critical positioning of classical work extends no further than simply stating, why shouldn't I, and people like it, which is absolutely fine um, and true. But to move the discipline forward, to graft it to contemporary discourse and to show that classical architecture not only has some relevance today, but might respond to some of the key questions of placemaking and architectural expression. We believe it needs to be part of an open and creative conversation, a conversation we sometimes find is more creative amongst those who never draw a volute. So as, as Carrie said, we've practiced, practiced together since 2010 and taught together at Kingston School of Art from the same year. Um, and we run what we think is the only classical design studio at the UK, UK School of Architecture. Uh, to begin this talk, we wanted to give you some background information um, on what uh, has been termed our Damascene conversion from uh, perhaps proto-modernists to um, aspiring classicists. So now, uh, unfortunately for you, uh, this conversion, if that's what you want to call it, was not as dramatic as St Paul's um, and neither has it had as significant an impact on Western art. Um, yet, but we thought it might be interesting to you, not because it's uh, particularly about us, but because rather our educational experience has been fairly typical of architecture graduates of our age and backgrounds and is representative of uh, the experience of probably many thousands of architects in the UK. And the reason why our paths have diverged and our died in the world modernist friends would say strayed from that of our colleagues is perhaps due to a combination of having to think uh, relatively early in our careers about what a building should look like and having to carry out this thinking simultaneously in the context of our own architectural practice and in the context of our teaching practice and the two as we shall see are fairly uh, closely intertwined. Uh, once Tim and I had graduated we both worked for small practices in London and in 2009-10 we had a small number of small private projects to work on. Um, we both lost our jobs in the 2008 financial crash and in the absence of any alternative, uh, set up our own practice. And this forced us to think, you know, what should our work look like? And at the same time, we'd also begun teaching an undergraduate design studio. Um, and so we we're confronting the same architectural questions with our students. And we, we really like this quote from uh, Adam Crusoe because it makes a crucial point about the emotional qualities of much classical and traditional architecture and urbanism and also emphasises the accessible nature of these qualities. This is important because it recognises that far from being a cold, dead language from the distant past, um, classical architecture and traditional forms have an immediate power and an emotional appeal that everyone can recognise and understand. They're objectively beautiful and can be understood simply on that level. It's not necessary to be a classicist to appreciate and understand the aesthetic and architectural qualities of classical architecture. So about that time in the mid 2000s, it was clear to us that the critically acclaimed contemporary practices whose work we admired were all drawing on precedents from both the distant and recent architectural past. This use of precedent was made quite explicit in an exhibition at the AA um, by Caruso Sinjin, which was uh, called Cover Versions. And work by the practice by Caruso Sinjin was presented next to the historical buildings which had informed it. At roughly the same time, uh, I think in about 2009, uh, Florian Weigel and the Architecture Research Unit at London Metropolitan University completed this building, uh, which is the Yul Hua Dang Book Hall in Paju Book City in Korea. Now, I think we can all agree that it's not a classical building, but its publication caused a bit of a stir at the time uh, because of its interpretation of classical elements, um, seen here probably most clearly in the abstracted cornices and the single brackets over the, uh, the, the large windows on the upper floors and also perhaps in its interiors, which were certainly traditionally influenced. An earlier house by uh, the Red House in Chelsea by Tony Fretton, um, completed in 2001, is also not a classical building. Um, this is the building on the left here. Um, there is a formal facade in red French sandstone, um, and there is elevational symmetry, albeit deliberately disrupted, um, 
and so I think it exhibits elements of classical architecture, although, as I say, it's, I wouldn't describe it as a classical building. And again, there's this uh, um, intention to form rooms rather than open spaces. And this, I think, is obvious on the upper floor, in particular on this piano nobile, which, of course, is a, another classical element. So in addition to those two architects I just mentioned, uh, the Swiss architect Peter Merkley was a frequent visitor and lecturer in London, and his strange, um, archaic, almost Mycenaean work was well known at the time. So what I hope this uh, admittedly very unscientific selection is showing you is that some of the most critically well-regarded London and European practices in the early part of this century were making work that was clearly inspired by architectural history, um, and also in some cases quite open about the sources of this historical inspiration. What seemed odd to us was that these architects were fascinated by architectural history and perhaps too by historical styles, but appear to be wary of approaching these things too directly or perhaps quoting from them too explicitly. Uh, this is the red line in St. James. And in places like this after lectures, we would ask each other the question, why not engage more directly with these buildings of the past that we also admire? And why should we admire and make every use of aspects of the buildings of the past except their architectural style. And put like this, it seemed to us that there was no clear reason other than personal preference not to engage directly with the classical way of designing a building. So we've engaged with the classical language of architecture from our position as architects and not from a position as classical scholars, which we're simply not. And using our understanding of space, form, volume and order, an understanding that is or ought to be common to all architects, um, we accept the orders as an objectively beautiful set of emotional, emotionally powerful forms that offer the means, or the potential at least, to conceive of and design buildings which might also be beautiful and powerful. So we're less interested in the mythical origins of the Corinthian order, for example, than in its ability to contribute to an architectural composition. And far from being restrictive, the order that the rules of classical architecture provide is actually liberating, guiding but not limiting, prompting but not dictating. These have been valuable lessons for us, and we think that they are lessons which should be communicated to more students. Um, so we're not born classicists and we're not academics of the classics, and we don't believe that classicism is the only way, although it may be our way. It's through our interest in architecture that we've arrived at our position, and classical buildings are for us inspirations and examples, rather than relics of past glories whose revival is ideological. We prefer good modernist buildings to bad classical ones, and there are plenty of examples of each, although we look to good classical buildings for inspiration in our, des in our design. Given this approach, much as we admire buildings such as Garnier's Opera, um, St Peter's and other grand buildings of the canon, it's buildings from the near and distant history which we can recognise as directly applicable to contemporary constructional, economic, typological and indeed expressive conditions which move us. These may be famous examples of restrained Nordic classicism, uh, as, as here, or a single column in a scruffy courtyard in Naples or Palermo. It seems to us that the presence of classicism in a building in whatever form and to whatever extent enables the building to speak directly to the expert and layman alike, without the advocacy required of many modern buildings. Like the merest hint of figuration in an abstract painting, it tugs insistently at us and lodges itself in our minds with meaning. So we'd now like to discuss some of our projects in relation to some of the characteristics that we enjoy in classical architecture, starting uh, with mass and monumentality. And there's sort of two very different examples here of that uh, by Michelangelo and Sigurd Leverant. So it might seem odd to talk about mass and monumentality in relation to a temporary project. But we thought this small example built for an architectural foundation event titled Metamorphoses, Classical Currents in Contemporary Culture and held in Greenwich demonstrates some of our interests in a direct, stacked, massy tectonic. Uh, Greenwich is on the River Thames to the east of central London and is the site of the Royal Naval College buildings by Christopher Wren, Nicholas Haw Hawksmore and John Vanbrugh. The event was hosted in the Queen's House by Inigo Jones and you can see that right in the centre of the picture in the, in the, sort of the middle distance. 
um, arguably Jones was the first, first proper classical architect in England. Uh, and you can see uh, here again, there's uh, the house on the left. And we contributed two cocktail bars, which without giving into the temptation of designing a room within a room, converted the orangery of the Queen's house into a bar. Um, and the orangery sits behind these five openings um, below the main loggia. Um, we've always wanted to design a pub, um, and this is the closest we've so far come to doing that. We wanted to install something which conveyed the aspects of classicism which we enjoy, weight and monumentality, order, relief and meaning. Surrounded by favourite architects of the past and the impressive English Baroque architecture, we looked at Hawksmoor's nearby St Alfred's Church. The window aprons uh, you can see here were approximately the same size as a bar and supported heavy sills, perfect for leaning drinkers. And we translated these features into monumental structures made with simple means, aerated concrete blocks, fibrous plaster and sheet aluminium. The artist Ian Hales made decorative champagne coolers which set off the mute colours of the bars. So these bars represent our interest in the classical language in microcosm. Local symmetries within the global symmetry of the orangery, um, they're neither diff different to their place nor bullying. Their material and tectonic qualities are expressive and practical, but not slavish or insistent. And they have a sort of a massy, weighty presence, um, which we enjoyed. I should say we are very limited on the weight loadings, which is why they're of aerated blocks. It's a very uh, valuable historic floor, so we weren't allowed to put too much weight on it. I think Tim will now share his screen. And on mute, there we go. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Um, okay, so uh, we would argue that the essence of a classical building um, is its persistence of balance, symmetry, focus, finality, proportionality and hierarchy. These, are quali these qualities are present in many buildings which would not necessarily be called classical uh, too. However, in the simplest terms, a classical building may be recognised as one whose decorative elements derive directly or indirectly from the architectural vocabulary of the ancient world. These elements are easily recognisable as, for example, columns of five standard varieties applied in standard ways of treating door and window openings and gable ends and standard runs of mouldings applicable to all these things. The most commonly recognised element of a classical building, the column, often stands on a pedestal and always supports an entablature. Those elements are then subdivided generally into three parts, the cornice, frieze and architrave, capital, shaft and base, and cap, die and plinth, as you can see in this diagram. The height of the column has a set relationship to the diameter of the column at its base. In this case, the Doric order, its height is eight times its diameter and the entablature is twice the diameter. If we look more closely at the entablature, we can see that its three components are further subdivided by a series of established fractions. Therefore, there is a relationship between these parts and the whole of the order. And this means that every one of the tiny fractions which determines the size of each molding relates to the di diameter of the column. In the specific case of the Doric order, there is another important set relationship, and this is the space between columns called intercolumniation. As the Doric has what, we, uh, what are called triglyphs over the columns, uh, and you can see those uh, these details here with square metopes between them, um, so, uh, uh, which must be square, the metopes are square, then the frieze has a horizontal rhythm which has its own set relationship to the diameter of the column. Columns must therefore be distributed horizontally in multiples of 1.25 diameters, as the labels show here. The other orders have established spacings too, and in the case of the Tuscan and Ionic, there is more freedom in the spacing than the other orders, as they have no horizontal constraints in their entablatures, as the Doric does. 
what are sometimes thought of negatively as the rules of classicism, which uh, it sounds rather like I'm describing here, are proscriptive, not prescriptive. Um, as Jonathan said, Jonathan said earlier, it means that they do not direct action, but constrain it. Instead of, of telling us what to do, they tell us what not to. Uh, we prefer uh, to call this principle order. Furthermore, it's worth illustrating the flexibility and in interpretation of the orders, with different architects altering the canon to suit their own aesthetic preferences. Our next project illustrates the application of the idea of order to the design of a large house. <clears throat> uh, the, the, this title is not uh, of our making, it was the, uh, the title of the competition. Um, and it was um, to investigate ideas of beauty um, through the design of this house for a landscape. Um, it's a, a large house, uh, the brief uh, indicated room by room uh, what the programme should include and situated on a lake in a landscape that had previously been a golf course. Um, our idea for the form and siting of the building was that it'd be like a bridge at the north end of the lake, reflected in the water and giving all rooms a southerly view across the lake and the landscape. And uh, this is that elevation um, looking over the lake. Uh, the entrance driveway meanders through this landscape, populated here with longhorn cattle, across a new bridge, which you can see here, um, up over a slight hill past um, um, a proposed swimming pool um, with, with, with some uh, yeah, uh, exotic trees and things like that, um, and uh, to a parterre on the north of the building, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, since the building is relatively long and thin, the plan was conceived as a row of rooms with a corridor along its axis. The idea was that as you walked along the corridor, you'd pass alternately through enclosed rooms, here shown in red, and more open lodger-like spaces in between. We established a major and minor order of rooms, major for important or more formal ones, such as the hall, living room and master bedroom, and minor for secondary rooms, such as anterooms or lobbies, bathrooms and the staircase. Uh, in the principal elevation to the lake, you can see that each of the enclosed rooms has windows in the wall and the in-between spaces are expressed as open lodges. In some cases, these are glazed and in some, they're an open balcony. The house uses the Doric order, so the width of the lodger has a relationship to its height. In this case, uh, we've not used triglyphs. And so the proportional and figurative character of the order permeates the character, character of the house i.e. Um, the height and width of these lodges um, has a relationship to the uh, depth of the, and height of the rooms behind. Uh, so in plan, beginning with this parterre to the north, which is the, uh, the termination of that meandering driveway, <clears throat> there is a, a staircase uh, behind a low wall here that runs down to a yard and access to the lower level that I'll show in a moment, and uh, garaging here uh, in, a, in a wing off on a skewed axis inspired by Villa Snellman. An entrance lodger with guest or staff accommodation to the north uh, and beyond that a rock garden which we'll see in section in a moment and the lake beyond. Um, so on entry there's a, a, an entrance hall to the guest accommodation here um, uh, and a, a fountain, a storeroom, and then entry to the main house into a, a small porch, circular porch, and onto uh, an anteroom, which gives to the left onto um, a lift down to the lower floor and back through to the guest accommodation, uh, to the right into um, some of the sort of back of house kitchen and staircase down to the um, uh, preparation, uh, the, the main kitchen, this would be a prep kitchen when catering is taking place, or onto a balcony here, which looks over a double height hall. Uh, moving to the left and the private end of the house, uh, we enter uh, the, the, the bedroom area. Uh, and here the, uh, the axis kinks uh, past a, a, an open lunette down to the lower floor and arriving in the master bedroom uh, on the central axis with the bed and the lodger in the gable end. 
uh, his and hers dressing rooms and bathrooms, uh, a bedroom, another bathroom, the main staircase, which will descend in a moment. And to the other end of, of the house, we have um, an ante room here, which might be a good place for standing for drinks just before dinner, um, an informal dining room and, and kitchen arrangement, um, a small study or um, uh, lounge room with a day bed and a fireplace in the center, and finally the larger living room and its own balcony. Um, coming back downstairs and past the fountain on the landing, uh, we arrive uh, turning to the right to the bedrooms, the children's bedrooms, and above this uh, square uh, lobby uh, with a central circular lunette back up to the main hall, so um, children and parents can shout up and down to one another. Uh, and that uh, lobby gives onto the rock garden, three bedrooms with en suites and a bathroom here. Coming back through past the bottom of the lift, um, cinema room, um, and uh, I don't remember what this is to be honest, um, and again access onto the, the rock garden. The lower space of the double height hall that we envisaged as um, something of a multi sort of functional place, um, parties, playroom, whatever that might be, a wine cellar and tasting room, a small pool and sauna, the pool at the exactly at the height of the lake. Uh, and then another lobby, this time octagonal, which doubles as a meeting room, home office, and uh, games room, gun room, and archive, uh, and the access back up round here to uh, the driveway. So these were all uh, these were all rooms which were uh, dictated by the brief. Um, the section here shows the entrance garaging, um, the entrance level through the porch, uh, Asplund's uh, uh, a woodland chapel comes to mind and the view across the double height space to the lake, uh, the rock garden, the lunette from ground floor, uh, parents' bedroom down to the, the lobby outside the kids' rooms, uh, down through the entrance to the uh, sort of office, the pool at the level of the lake, um, and the gable um, elevations, uh, ostensibly the same, um, but at the uh, uh, bedroom end, the lodger is recessed and more private. And at the living room end, it projects um, as a balcony. Again, that initial view along the driveway on approach. This is a view of the entrance parterre, the garaging and the, um, the entrance lodger here. The view from the entrance, uh, the balcony over the double height hall to the right along the corridor to the uh, living room, looking into the dining room and the uh, recessed, sorry, from the dining room uh, through the uh, sort of study area and an open lodger through to the living room at the end. And that, that was the final image. Um, so I hope you could see there that the armature of the classical order sort of provoked and supported spatial ideas and offered opportunities for the subversion of order and access for practice, practical as well as delightful um, purposes. So you establish a rule and there are always classical sort of tropes for breaking those in intriguing ways. Um, so this is another competition for a Woodland Visitor Centre in Surrey, um, which has a rather freer um, application of some of these ideas. The building was sited in a clearing in the woodland and is screened by a belt of trees from the car park, which you see down the middle the building here, the car park here. Uh, that also helps to make sure the building is initially approached um, only from the front uh, uh, through the designated um, pathway. We wanted the building to nestle into the woodland glade like a ceremonial encampment of tents, um, uh, uh, similar to this in this painting here. It should be festive, and memorable, uh, and we were thinking of, um, of this event. Um, it's the meeting of King Henry VIII of England and France I of France in 1520. And um, that here, the elevation suggests a small encampment with a building articulated as two tents in much the same way. Um, on the left, there is a, a timber shingle roofed uh, tent, as it were, 
um, uh, and on the right a, a copper roof tent with a with a slightly uh, curved pitch and a frilly bottom um, inspired by a small building by Leverance. Uh, the plan is more ordered than the massing uh, and a roughly F-shaped round earth wall shown here in black frames the main spaces um, with round earth Tuscan columns giving status to the most important rooms. Um, so I mean, you can almost imagine uh, this, these spaces existing only as rammed earth and, and this quite weighty, almost archaic um, uh, 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 mood. <clears throat> and then in grey, um, minor spaces, sort of service spaces and the like, um, with a, a sort of timber frame uh, uh, structure. Um, the entrance is, is here, um, a, a paved area with a fountain, um, with a lower pool uh, to serve uh, thirsty dogs. Uh, toilets are accessed from, from there for people uh, needing facilities whilst taking walks around the woodlands. Um, there's an outdoor uh, seating area here under the canopy of the roof uh, and uh, a central column, quite an unusual device um, here into uh, the entrance hall, which then leads off in, in a couple of directions, one through to the um, uh, uh, office uh, kitchen uh, which would then serve a hatch and the picnic area to one side and the other into the main exhibition hall uh, over on, on this side. Uh, in section um, you can see uh, looking through that long section through the main building a dog um, about to take a drink from the the low pool the entrance column um, rather like those individual columns Jonathan showed earlier in Naples and, and um, Palermo, um, uh, something that, uh, that might be a sort of friendly guardian to the building. Another Asplund inspired top lit uh, entrance space, a fire, uh, and then this um, uh, exhibition space top lit with a sort of billowing ceiling uh, in matte and gloss, which you'll see in a moment. Um, here is a, a close-up of the entrance. Uh, so you can see here that the, the sort of order along underneath this entrance in tablature begins with a column, it then has the end of a wall and then another column. So uh, quite, quite a loose, quite an informal um, deployment of order there. And once inside the hall, uh, this is the fire, that top lit space and looking into the uh, moment of relative darkness before going into the bright exhibition space, which is here. Um, Schinkel's tent room at uh, Schloss Charlottenhof was uh, uh, obviously a precedent here and is a particular favorite of ours, um, but in, uh, expressing those stripes in, in quite subtle changes in finish rather than uh, changes in color. And this is a, a build, a, an image of the approach to the building um, in its forest clearing. And back to Jonathan. I think you're still muted, Jonathan. You'd think we'd have got a handle on all of this after a year. Sorry, yeah, I, uh, that's a bit strange. It's suddenly... Right. Sorry, it's a bit annoying, it just goes back to the beginning. Right. Uh, so finally, um, what, what one of the uh, compositional lessons that classical architecture has taught us is an approach to composing space and volume. And rooms in a classical building tend to have a clear axis of symmetry and are generally arranged to be 
perfectly composed within themselves. So each room within an often imperfect site is a perfectly composed world within itself, which relates to adjacent rooms only in as much as a direct connection needs to be made between them. This way of thinking is perhaps counterintuitively and very freeing. And you can see the great ingenuity with which Sone here has arranged a series of regular rooms on an irregular site in the old Bank of England. Um, one of the ideas that's very useful in thinking about composition is the idea of poche. Um, this is both a conceptual technique and an actual thing or part of a building. And here you can see the principal rooms and axes have been isolated. Initially, if you think about only the main spaces um, in a building, it establishes a strong hierarchy. And anything which is not a principal space can be thought of as poche. Here you can see the main external spaces also treated as rooms, helping to organise the relationships between the rooms. The next one, uh, you can see the poche spaces shown in black. So poche can be rooms or external spaces or even just thick shaped pieces of wall. In the final slide, you see the kind of a poche masking the original plan to highlight the main spaces. Um, and this idea of poche was an important organising tool in the next project we'd like to show you, which was uh, another competition <laughs> uh, for a funerary chapel in Dublin. Um, and the brief for this was for a, a, a funerary chapel uh, just outside Dublin, uh, which had to, which had a very high turnover of use, um, and it wasn't it was a chapel of no particular faith. So, um, and it had to be organised so that one group of mourners could gather while another was using the chapel, and then left by a separate entrance. So it was a, it was a bit of a sausage factory to be honest. Um, and the site was not an attractive one, uh, uh, not very pleasant sort of graveyard um, next to an important, but again, an unattractive monument to the Easter Rising um, and surrounded on two sides by a railway line uh, and on another side by a canal. Um, and so in thinking, uh, you can see that you can see the sites here, the, the site for the building is circled in red and the blue line shows the um, sort of the circulation around the site. And um, so this is from the competition documents. And so thinking about how we should sort of uh, make a building of no particular faith, but which still had to have some sort of resonance, um, we looked uh, to Lutchen's designs for the War Graves Commission following the First World War. So um, these buildings and monuments are, are mute, but they're subtle and extremely dignified. Um, they don't represent a single faith, but have an architectural power um, which speaks of the universality of loss. We felt that the graveyard of our site required respect, um, but not necessarily deference from our building, and that perhaps the building might give a focus and dignity to the site as a whole. Um, another sort of good example of the type of building which we were sort of thinking of were these two mausolea by um, Sigurd Leverance and uh, Asplund um, in Stockholm. And again, we thought they had a kind of a quiet dignity um, and a restrained and appropriate classicism. Um, so we thought that a volume like a bit like this might contain um, a bright chapel distant from its context. Um, and we had recently visited this building, which is the 1829 Oratory uh, in Liverpool, which was previously a mortuary chapel to the Anglican Cathedral. Um, it's a plain and relatively simple Greek revival building uh, by John Foster. It's slightly mute on the outside, uh, but on the inside it's bright and top lit and is currently used as an art gallery. And so just sort of the plan involved thinking of the main spaces and sort of pocheting out everything else which wasn't important. Um, and these sketches show the first sort of stabs, stabs at that. Um, so the, the interior is conceived of quite separately uh, from the outside. Um, the sort of strong volume of the building creates a square against the or rectangular paved area against the 1916 memorial. And this idea of the oval form gives orientation to the space, um, but also actually produces some useful poche, which uh, we're able to use for supporting functions. 
And so this is the final form. You can see it's entirely composed around the main space of the entrance hall here and the chapel here, which is aligned to the cardinal point. So the, the chapel faces east. Um, you come in here through a small, small loggia um, and then into the hall and then tucked into the, the poche space, there's an office, loose, um, two light wells and spaces for coffin storage, and robing rooms for the priests or celebrants. Um, and you can see that the entrance into the chapel from this square entrance hallway is past the fireplace which is screened on the chapel side by a freestanding column with a pilastri to the side. And then this arrangement here is balanced and echoed on the other side by um, a screen of pilasters. So, so for the a competition, uh, I'm not sure we ever really we ever really cracked the exterior of this, but it has it has some 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 good things about it. Um, and so the idea is it was a simple and robust brick form, um, which, as we say, gives a setting for the 1916 uh, monument. And you enter here, and the whole idea was it should be sort of impassive and subdued, in contrast to the interior, which is light filled and uplifting and spatially and materially rich. And we'd found this house by uh, Walter Sykes George um, in New Delhi and we really enjoyed the simplicity of the blocky forms uh, in combination with its latent classicism. And we found it while we we're looking at this building which is um, by uh, uh, Arthur Shoesmith and also in New Delhi it's a garrison church and it's an incredibly powerful uh, monumental brick form with battered walls and very few visible openings. Um, and then in contrast, the interior is sort of somehow heavy and light at the same time. Um, I think it's all done in reinforced concrete, um, but it's really sort of cool and light filled. So in our building, we try to do a similar thing. So inside the architecture is less brute and the materials are more refined. And the richer materials of the interior line the entrance loggia, you can just sort of see them here, but are subsumed into the back into the external wall with only the cornice of the entablature continuing around the elevations as a string course. The, the entrance hall opens off the loggia and is a generous perfect cube. Um, we wanted it to have a sort of feeling that was both sort of decorous and domestic. Um, it's formal but also welcoming and needed to be large enough to accommodate gathering mourners um, but we didn't want it to feel institutional and so we imagined that uh, like a hallway uh, in a large country house. So in winter a, a fire will burn in the fireplace between the two doorways to the chapel and on the right are niches uh, for floral displays and photographs of the deceased. Uh, from the hallway you get a glimpse of the much larger chapel and you can tell that it's a, a quite different space orientated on a separate access. The poche spaces which take up the gap between the two geometries of the hall and the, uh, and the chapel are lined in a black polished Kilkenny marble, um, partly to make the, their irregular shapes difficult to read, um, but also to give you a moment of sort of pause or dislocation as you pass from one space into the next. Um, and you know, without wanting to sort of labour the point too much, we, we liked the idea that for a brief moment, passing from the hallway into the chapel, you're suspended in sort of this black nothingness. Um, and a bit like a you know a character in a in a medieval Last Judgment painting, you're waiting to be taken up or cast down as your as your character is dictated. Um, the, the chapel itself is a high, calm oval space uh, with a catafalque placed at the east end of the oval in front of a screen and a niche. Um, and the oval is quite good; it's a directional shape, so it focuses your attention towards the east. And after the service, the mourners would exit under this great south window. Uh, through this through this door here. Um, the chapel is lit, um, sorry the chapel niche is lit through a concealed high level window out of sight of the mourners. Uh, you see a sort of sketch section here, um, it's sort of an arrangement which is stolen from Bernini. Uh, the idea is for the catafalque sitting on its uh, little gutte feet. And the space couldn't be a Baroque chapel as much as we like would have liked it to be. So we try to give it a dignified municipal character. The materials are simple, good quality, but robust. 
um, cross section to the chapel and a long section. And you can see the ceiling in white plaster uh, billows down over the, over the congregation. You see the arrangement of the hidden light sources here. Um, and the um, materials are, are sort of just illustrated a bit here. This was a, a kind of a working sketch we did, not, not really a presentation one, but you can see at a high level, you have a, a precast uh, concrete cornice. Um, and then here, bricks laid in, glazed bricks laid in header bond to give a kind of shimmer at a high level. Uh, and then another cornice. And then we, we had the idea that the whole chapel would be below the cornice, would be laid in these long Roman bricks. Um, and because they're so long, um, at the, the, the point of the oval where the radius, of, the radius is smallest, um, it would create this ripple effect because, because the one course, one course of, of bricks would overhang the course below. We weren't proposing it to be orange like this, it's just an illustration. So you get a ripple of texture at the moments of kind of greatest intensity in the space. Um, that's just uh, another view. Um, so for our final two projects, we wanted to say something about the direct use of historic precedent in architecture. And architects have always looked to precedent, um, both historic and contemporary. Uh, and we don't see any reason to be embarrassed about this. Um, a good historic example of this type of thinking uh, is the Greek revival. Um, and in the later 18th century, it became possible um, for Northern Europeans to visit the sites of ancient Greece, um, which was then under the control of the Ottoman Empire. And the surveying and recording these buildings, buildings provided the source material for a quite inventive period of architectural creation in the UK uh, in the following years. Um, and surprisingly for a movement which set out to be a, a kind of a close uh, archaeological reconstruction of ancient Greece, it actually um, produced some extraordinarily inventive materials, uh, buildings, sorry, perhaps some of the most inventive buildings. Um, but here um, is one of the one of the books that was produced, The Antiquities of Athens by uh, James Stewart and Nicholas Rivet. Um, Rivet, sorry. Uh, and in the preface here in the highlighted uh, section, it sort of sets out their, their intention that by closely surveying the, uh, the great monuments of the ancient world, it would sort of somehow provoke a better, a better architecture. Um, and so this, the process went something like this. Um, this is the Acropolis um, photographed uh, in 1960s, in the 1960s. It's the, uh, the caryatid porch of the Erexion. Uh, this was it, as Stuart and Rivette found it 200 years before, looking remarkably similar. And this is one of their measured drawings, um, apparently done to one one hundredth of an inch. This is uh, St Pancras New Church, uh, built in 1822 on the Euston Road in London uh, by H.W. and W. Inwood. If you look at the porch on the far right of the picture here, you can see it looks very familiar. And it really is almost a direct copy of the caryatid porch of the Rexian. If you now transfer your, I'm sorry, this is it again back on the Acropolis. If you now transfer your attention to the tower of the, or the steeple of the church, you can look back to uh, Stuart and Rivat. Um, on the left, you can see the Tower of the Winds and on the right, you can see the monument of Lysicrates. Um, and both these elements are combined very directly in the steeple of the church. And so the whole building arises through a kind of act of creative copying. Um, some elements from antiquity are reproduced very precisely, um, but the overall composition, which has been transported across time, place and culture, is unlike anything that existed in ancient Greece. Um, and this approach didn't only apply to high status buildings uh, like churches. Um, Again, this is uh, Stuart and Rivette in Athens at the, uh, the, the Karagic Monument of Thrasyllus, just underneath the Acropolis. Uh, so the detail of this drawing of the, that building. Um, and this is the Lloyd Baker estate in London. And you can see here that the 
paired door cases are an interpretation of the, the Thrasyllus monument. Um, and then the final example is just really because I like it is on the left of fragments from the Isle of Delos and on the right is Bodmin cattle market in uh, Cornwall. Um, and you can see again it's very direct translation from a, a kind of a temple to a cattle market sort of strange but somehow uh, quite affecting. Um, and so the first example of a translation of ours is principally a typological uh, but also a tectonic or constructional translation which Tim will take you through now. Okay, um, so this is uh, uh, an ideas competition run by the Greek Thompson Society to celebrate the bicentenary of Alexander the Greek Thompson's birth and ask for an interpretation of Thompson's Villa Maria. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, of 1857 to be proposed on a triangular site in Glasgow, very close to some of his tenement housing projects. Uh, and uh, Thompson's own house at number one Moray Place, which was later occupied by his champion, the late Gavin Stamp, and that's the this house at the far end of Moray Place. Um, so Thompson's villa is uh, two, uh, two side by side, uh, but flipped and appearing as one. So you can see the bay window to the left of the entrance here, bay window to the left of the entrance here. Um, so they're exactly the same, um, uh, but flipped and on, and on the approach, it is as if one lives in a house which is twice the size as one's actual house. This is the triangular site uh, and this here is Moray Place. So Thompson's own house there and Gavin Stamp's late, far later um, is the end one here. Um, so there's a railway line running actually under a corner of the site and along here, embankment, plenty of trees, uh, typical Glasgow tenements uh, all around. Uh, another tenement here by Thompson uh, with a single story parade of shops and a, a sort of drum shaped corner, which uh, it was a, an important uh, part of a reference for our design. Um, and another tenement, uh, Thompson tenement further up this street, I think, but many are um, sort of in the, in the Thompson vein. Um, and Greek Thompson practice in Glasgow in the mid 19th century is well known as a prolific pro uh, proponent of Greek revival architecture, hence his moniker, the Greek. Uh, but actually he rarely left Glasgow and never, never left the UK, but um, his style is highly eclectic with uh, Egyptian and Mayan motifs combined with also combined with the Greek. Um, and his numerous surviving buildings are consistent in their quality. And we would argue in fact, that he is the architect of Glasgow that should be most closely associated with Glasgow rather than Rennie Mackintosh, who is of course uh, far more famous. Um, his ambition was the same as Schinkel's, uh, to build not as the Greeks built, but as they would have built had they lived now. Um, he was a commercial architect, providing a lot of housing um, and commercial buildings uh, uh, in this uh, incredible style. So um, he was not um, a sort of highfalutin architect, but one engaged uh, absolutely in, in the commercial life of, the, um, of Glasgow at the time, which of course was a very powerful city. Um, his oeuvre includes uh, suburban villas, uh, which you can see here. This is an image of the double villa that we were uh, uh, working to. And urban tenements, churches and commercial buildings were the four, essentially the four um, sec sectors or typologies you work with. Um, so the insertion of a pair of villas, a potentially suburban type into the centre of Glasgow and a constrained site, um, presented something of a typological dilemma in interpreting Thompson. Uh, but it seemed to us that in translating uh, his work onto that site, the solution might lie in his churches. These buildings present a massy comp composition of elements to the city, often raised on a acropolis like Plinth. And these are, these are his three significant churches. As one approaches and navigates around the churches, the elements making up the elevation or composition separate and become visible as individual entities, as parts contributing to the whole, 
So if you look at Caledonia Road Church, uh, sorry, there's St Vincent Street Church here in the centre. Uh, these are uh, three other views of it, um, in which the relation of the temple atop its plinth and the tower um, rotate um, to present quite different uh, view um, as one rotates around it. It seemed to us that the island site, surrounded by the strong forms of these tenements, uh, following the perimeters of their city blocks, needed a strong urban response, something other than two villas in open gardens, and we were keen to avoid a single double villa, as that felt too close to Thompson's original. Um, so the rammed concrete wall proposed around the site has perhaps something of the character of Thompson's church plinths, presenting a robust edge to the street and protecting the gardens within. The perimeter wall gathers the two houses on the site into one assemblage, and seen from afar, the buildings are assembled into a single composition of plinth, pediment and roofs, as you can see here. Thompson's double villa is one house divided into two, whereas our proposal is for two houses that appear as one. The proposal uh, is an assemblage of architectural elements that is not dissimilar to the slightly loose arrangement of buildings on the Acropolis, an illusion that Thompson might have enjoyed. Uh, and on the right is uh, a lesser known Thompson building, um, which is a, a pair of pediments, one little and one large, uh, and our pediments are one with two bays and one with three uh, in a similar way. And each corner of the site is a rotunda that acts either as a summer house or garden storage, and which rhymes with the rounded corners of the surrounding tenements, as well as echoing the single story circular end to Thompson's uh, uh, shopping, uh, the, the shopping uh, precinct sort of arcade at the end of his Nithsdale Street, which you can see here rhyming with the shed roof of ours. Um, so one house in, in the plan, you can see that they are actually two separate houses. Uh, one is larger, uh, one is smaller um, across the, uh, the small, uh, across the mews. Um, and they share a common party with sleeping accommodation on the ground floor, uh, sheltering behind the massive round concrete walls and looking into secluded courts and, and private gardens and living accommodation on the Piano Nobile, taking advantage of long views up and down the streets and across the city and to the family of nearby Thompsons. Uh, and they face one another, albeit in a rotative fashion across the mews. Uh, so uh, on approaching, rather like Thompson's double villa, on approaching your own house, um, you are you're well separated from the entrance to the other house. So you get this proximity, um, but you also get um, a requisite sort of privacy and ownership of one's own house. Um, so rotated in uh, plan, so the entrance and living spaces have different relationships with the muse, as, as we saw in the image. Um, the Ionic entrance lodges are freestanding buildings uh, and again rotated and allowing views through them into the gardens, but, but, somewhat, but, but filtered. Um, uh, and uh, the, the boundary wall here forms a kind of a ha-ha, so on the north, so you get a little extra sun for this garden, it slopes up, a bit like the rock garden in the project I showed previously. Um, uh, uh, for, for, that, for that house. Um, each lodger gives onto a porch, so although they're, they're different sizes, um, there's, uh, they follow a similar sort of plan ideas. So into a porch initially, then into a preliminary hallway, that's smaller in this one than this one, and then onto a corridor serving the bedrooms and terminating in an open space. And that's the same in this way. Um, and uh, bathrooms and things taking up push a space between uh, the geometry of the site and the geometry of the houses themselves. Uh, rising up the stairs uh, in each case uh, brings us to the living spaces, which again um, are, are siblings. They are very similar in their conception. And that is that they are um, a, a sort of wing to a main temple-like space with a portico at each end um, and open to the ceiling. So the pitched ceiling um, is a characteristic feature of these rooms. In the larger house, there's a roof terrace here, um, a large living space to the south um, and taking advantage using the portico like a bay window, uh, dining, kitchen um, and a balcony on the north side. 
uh, and the smaller house has a kitchen, a kitchen in its kind of annex wing, uh, and then a single open space. But again, having a balcony to one side um, and a bay window uh, to the other. This is a view from uh, blah, 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 from this room, looking past the fireplace and out through the portico, uh, past the smaller two bay portico of the smaller house and up to its summer house. Uh, in section here, this is that same space looking to the smaller portico uh, and uh, up the rock garden to the summer house uh, on the corner. Uh, a similar section facing another way and cutting through the staircase. And you can see in the larger house, a fountain on a landing. You can tell we quite like to do one of them if someone gives us the chance. Uh, and a projecting um, basin from the upstairs bathroom where one can wash one's hands looking back over the double height, very tall um, in proportion uh, entrance porch. Um, and here you can see uh, ideas of Thompson. We, we, we're referring to Thompson very, very directly um, with uh, edicular windows set into the thickness of the wall uh, with the Greek pediments, geometries very much the same as Thompson. Um, and an idea of um, a very clear urban typology. And this is his Great Western Terrace where there's a, 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 a rigorous rhythm um, and at this distance, a relatively abstract urban form. But as one approaches uh, the artistry and things like the ironwork um, and the glazing and the interiors of these um, buildings uh, are really extraordinary. And particularly the hallway spaces, which is a characteristic of the Greek revival as an exterior, exterior feel to many of those hallways. And that's what we were thinking of for our, our staircases and double height porches. Um, but where we, where we um, deviated from Thompson was in an idea about how these buildings would be constructed. Glasgow is a city of red sandstone, um, uh, an expensive thing to use now in the way that we would, like to, we would have liked to use it. And so we were thinking again of mass and monumentality and ways in which contemporary architects um, have managed to do such things. Um, Looking to uh, Peter Zumthor here with this, with the sort of rammed, uh, sort of dry mix rammed earth or concrete uh, walls, and Stephen Taylor in Somerset with these columns, it didn't seem a great leap to consider our building as um, a sort of essay in aggregate materials from these rough uh, concretes to quite fine uh, uh, terrazzos and possibly marbles in some of the um, some of the finer detailing. Like the discs in the in the architrave, um, and this is uh, in the EUR, and so we were considering our building to be an essay in red aggregates. Certainly, at this scale, brick did not seem an appropriate uh, material to use because its module is far too legible. Whereas on a vast building, the brick um, uh, is completely subordinated into the overall mass. Uh, it wouldn't have been the case with these buildings. Um, so you can see here some of the textures, the really rough. Um, rammed concrete, um, in, uh, finer in situ concrete, uh, precast elements for the porticos, and then very fine um, uh, terrazzo for, for linings and things like that. Over to Johnny for what will be the final project. Yes, and I might even be able to start it at the right side. Yes. There we go. Right. Um, so this is, as Tim says, the final project. Um, it's the conversion, well, sorry, the refurbishment and extension of a late Georgian townhouse in London. Um, and it's perhaps, a, it's kind of quite a direct, formal translation of some uh, ancient as well as neoclassical precedents. Um, so this is the street the house is on, um, a, a, a nice, a very nice street of say late, late Georgian houses sort of completed at, at different times by different builders and sort of batches. 
Um, a lot of the house we didn't do very much to at all, um, apart from some redecoration. Um, I'm just showing you this to give you a, a flavour of our clients' um, tastes and interests. Um, they are opera lovers, uh, wine buffs, um, and they have an amazing collection of architectural prints which are distributed throughout the house. We also required a, a specific home. Um, they've sort of there's lots of good original joinery, some you know good good plaster work um, which has survived. Um, and they have uh, sort of furnished it in a, a quite sort of individual way, but with sort of nice nice pieces of furniture. Um, and so the one sort of sore thumb in this <laughs> in this nice scene was this existing rear extension, which you can you can see here. Um, it was sort of really badly constructed, I think, probably in the in the late 1960s. Um, and uh, it, it needed to come down. It was there was a, there was a kitchen here, um, a shower room sort of wedged in here, um, and the garden was in a sort of quite a poor poor state. Um, and so I'll use this drawing just to describe the layout of the of the building as a whole, but also also um, what we did. So it, it's a typical um, London arrangement um, where you come into a raised ground floor um, slightly above um, pavement level. There are coal cellars uh, underneath the pavement and the pavement itself is separated from the house by a, a front area, so a, a light well. Um, this was where we did most of our work on the back here, the new extension, and we did some garden work. Um, and we did, or rather the builder did, a lot of digging. Um, at the front here, he extended the coal cellars, we extended the coal cellars, the coal vaults down, um, so you could stand up in them. Um, there's a new wine cellar uh, inserted below the existing lower ground floor. Um, which was more or less at garden level. And we um, built this room for the architectural prints, which the client calls the map room. Um, and so this, this plan here is a, is a plan through this, this sort of level here, just picking up the wine cellar and the map room. Uh, on the level, the next level up, which is this one, lower, lower, ground, lower ground floor, um, there's a dining room. Uh, we jiggled the kitchen and the, and the garden room around so the kitchen moves into the centre of the plan. There's a small garden room here. Uh, this is the top of the map room pick, just picked up in the plan cut and then these sort of landscaping works. And at the front here you can see the new coal cellars turned into a, an office um, and then this is the front area which separates the sort of the edge of the pavement from the, from the dining room. Um, level above um, we put the shower room back in, slightly larger but more or less in its original place off the, the half landing from the stair. Um, and the rest of the house follows a fairly typical London pattern. Um, a large room going all the way across the front, a small room at the back next to the stair. Um, and so we're thinking about you know, what, what the extension should look like. And we wanted it to have a, a degree of formality because um, so, uh, you know, these houses were designed for people to live on the the sort of the raised ground floor and the first floor and in the large rooms facing the front of the house facing the street and the basements were very much a secondary lower status space but of course now everyone wants to live um, downstairs next to the garden and so the whole house has been sort of slightly inverted um, and so it felt appropriate to us that the new elevation to the garden should have a state should, should have an expression which reflected its new status to a degree um, and again so we were looking again at Stuart and Rivet and the the, um, the the monument of Thrasyllus um, and this this uh, this building is used as a precedent in the Lloyd Baker estate which is not very far from this building and so we thought this would be um, a good place to start and of course it's not exactly the same. Um, um, this is this is our elevation drawing. You see uh, the buildings change from two bays in the precedent to three bays in our example and the stone plinths at the upper level have turned into lead planters 
uh, one of which conceals a shower room, the other one just balances it. Um, we weren't using builders who are used to doing classical architecture, so we had to be quite explicit in the drawings. Um, this is setting out drawing for the brick arches spanning between the, the columns and, um, and we uh, laser cut uh, MDF templates that the builders could use to get the correct um, uh, sort of diminution of the columns. Um, and this is the uh, finished result, the more or less finished result, um, all done in uh, a, a, a London pale London stock with lime mortar. Um, you can see here the the plinths of the of the Preston translated into these lead planters, which are then uh, planted up. Um, the garden room sits behind these two bays, and so is sort of symmetrical in itself. Um, the third bay is split to accommodate the map room, which also looks onto a shallow light well here, and the shower room which then sits behind this sash and up behind this planter. So on the right hand side the, the level is split. Um, uh, this is just fun. This is um this was the uh, the lead being cast on the planters um, into this into the sand, um, sand casting um, to pick up the, the lettering areas. This is a fantastic flood of silver, which I quite enjoy. Um, that's the finished result and you can see we sort of uh, there's all sorts of brick bonds used to to make up the um, to get the heights of these various mouldings in in the right place um, and the the, the mouldings are are sort of precast stone or reconstituted stone um, and this just is, is a section just to really describe the, the layout of um, the shower room and the map room both sitting behind the single sash um, and then the stairs down to the new wine cellar here and the very narrow lead planter here concealing this upper part of the roof. Uh, that's the bathroom so you know straightforward um, but this this inner window looks out through the sash uh, towards the garden. Um, this is the map room um, which looks up towards sort of a fountain at the end of the garden. It has an internal window which looks up into the um, into the garden room, and these are very shallow drawers which hold the client's collection of architectural prints. And there's um, some special Pevsner sized drawers which you can't see in this shot, but are sized to hold the client's collection of um, Pevsner's architectural guides, which I think is probably one of the things he's most pleased about of the whole job. <laughs> um, um, and then this is a section, uh, sort of a cross section. So you can see this is, this is the garden room here, which has single central column um, expressed internally. Um, you see the low level window down to the map room, the shower room here, and this sort of a modulated ceiling. Um, and showing you that section, because at the same time we're thinking of small spaces in London, um, small neoclassical spaces, and we were thinking of uh, the sewing museum, of course, these um, very small rooms with glimpses up and down and through to other spaces. And uh, we were also thinking about concealed light sources as here in the, the breakfast room at Lincoln's Inn Fields. You can see light comes down through a skylight hidden behind the sort of at the edge of the saucer dome. Um, we really wanted to use yellow glass, but the client didn't like it, so we didn't get to do that. Um, although we did get the roof light and uh, perennial favourite, the tent room at uh, Schloss Char Charlottenhof by Schinkel. And this is the finished uh, thing. Um, and so you can see these concealed sort of light sources here. There's another one. There's another one up here, which you can't see because it's out of the shot. Central oculus with a moulding around it. Um, a view through to the garden landscaping. Uh, it's just a, a close-up showing the top of the capital. This is the only express column really in the whole thing. Um, and on the left here you can see a glimpse down to the map room and out through the, the, the map room sash window. So all these spaces are connected with sort of oblique views. Um, and because this 
this level is where the floor level of the shower room comes in and this is not really a very nice proportion so we extended it upwards into a, a nicer proportion with a with a mirror um, and this is something which might happen it might not so the whole thing might be trump loyal to look a bit like the Shinko tent room um, so this is a, a sketch for that and the client's still making up their mind about it um, not sure what I feel about it I think I'd like it um, and this is just quickly to show you the um, the what we did with the coal sellers uh, we managed to persuade the conservation officer to let us use the the original coal holes um, and to glaze them over so they provided top light um, the sort of the beigey colour here is the original brickwork and then that was all underpinned to create a space that you could you could stand up in and so it's quite a quite a nice um, study with these two two vaults um, this is the dining room which was left more or less as it was apart from a new window but this is the the start of the staircase down to that new study um, uh, this was the vaults being underpinned um, there's some nice brickwork which unfortunately had to be covered up because you can't waterproof it from the outside um, and this is that study is sort of very intensively used now um, but with mirrors um, a bit like sewn to sort of um, sort of diffuse the space slightly um, there's a wine cellar uh, with a cast concrete vaulted ceiling uh, um, precast concrete um, shelves for the wine bottles with um with lighting cast into the bottom of them and a a, a pament floor which has been sealed with sort of, uh, linseed oil and beeswax um and the cellar is not is not insulated so it's just and it's not cooled either so it's just the temperature of the earth um keeps it at a although the mass of the surrounding earth keeps it at a constant temperature um, it's just to show you a little bit of the garden it's a very tight site um, and this is the this is the wall of the next door neighbor and um, you can see there's a large um, um, sort of social housing project here um, but we built a fountain at the end of the garden to make the whole space seem a, a bit bigger um, and uh, this was an early sketch for the paving pattern um, and the pattern is done in these two different types of Portland stone a smooth one and a, and a rough one um so this is the the fountain um the client really wanted a, a a lined head um spout so that's that's their that's their thing um and uh, it empties into a portland stone basin which itself empties into this pool which runs into um this uh, brick arch and then this pool overflows this portland stone weir uh, into another small pool at the front and the whole thing just circulates around it's it's a very on a very hot on a hot day it's a nice place to sit with a cold glass of wine um, and that is another view of the outside and you'll be relieved to know the end of the lecture <laughs> thank you um we're, we've activated the mics um, in the hopes that maybe some of the audience might have a question or two. I know we're running a little bit late in the afternoon. Studios are about to begin, but um, is there anyone? Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> is there anyone that um, would like to ask a question? Uh, I have a question. Peter. Yes, thank you. Hi guys. Um, so, <laughs> I hope you're right. Um, the final project is a wonderful example of how taking inspiration from the past and applying it to you know the client's requirements, the tectonic, resulting in something set apart from the past but still retaining the spirit of its time. What is your position on taking from the past, and what do you say to the people who say? You were just copying. Thank you. Uh, I, I suppose it's quite simple, really. I mean, you know, architecture, <clears throat> a building can only be done uh, in its time and in its place. And uh, I think the Greek revival shows that 
even having extremely erudite people trying their very best to do exactly the same as their inspiration, uh, you arrive at something different. Um, in the same way that um, looking at Renaissance architecture in different parts of Italy where different materials are available, um, you have architecture which is um, absolutely of a, of a movement, but, uh, but which is different. Um, in different uh, in different geographical locations, uh, and um, and the the typology, or put more simply, the brief will be different from one place to another. So it's just not a problem. Um, and I suppose more broadly, um, we we're, we're very happy to see ourselves as part of a. Uh, uh, um, the continuity of architecture and, and see no need to uh, make an abrupt break with the past. We see no reason that a single building must demonstrate an abrupt change from what had been pre-existing pre and what is new. Uh, and Lutchens is, uh, is a constant um, source of inspiration in many ways, but, but particularly in the way that you can take something older and add to it. And it's not always clear where the new and the old is. And it's also quite possible, much as we revere the work of, uh, of earlier times, um, that it's not as good as what we can do now. And, um, you know, there, there is a possibility that what we do is better than what was there before. So why subordinate it from the word go? Thank you. Victor, good to see you. I see Victor Dupi, uh, professor here at the school. Oh, you're muted, Victor. You're muted. <laughs> we don't, I, do, I don't hear you. I don't know if others do. Could you type the question in the chat, maybe? Yeah, if that's possible, I'm happy to read it. Or maybe Ray, who's still on, and he can generally solve all problems. I don't know. If is it Mr. Dupi's office that's the other side of the wall drawing that our students did a few weeks ago? <laughs> I believe so. <laughs> Maybe he's typing it into the chat. Yeah, the microphones um, have been activated for everyone. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not, it's not showing his mute. <laughs> Very strange. <laughs> well, I believe he's typing it in at the moment, so I'll do my best to uh, to read it so you can respond. <laughs> so today is the 21st of April, the birthday <laughs> of Rome, a city that I don't recall in your presentation. Any thoughts? Rome is the city that has leapt into my mind more frequently than any other um, travel destination over the last year. I, I can't explain exactly why, but um, that's the place I've longed for when I've longed for anywhere. Maybe Jono could give you a more serious answer. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. I, I suppose we've um, um, well. I, I suppose. I suppose we've been talking about our our, our work and perhaps our our inspirations are lie closer to home in sort of northern northern Europe, you know, the, the sort of Scandinavian stuff we talked about. Um, um, and you know, the, the English Baroque. Um, but you know, uh, if if you'd come to another talk, we, we might well have spent spent some time in Rome. <laughs> I think it's just I think it's just um just a, a coincidence really. But I mean we tend to, you know, in our own work we sort of we tend to sort of stay a little bit of, of a distance away from the canon um, of which you know, a lot is found in Rome. Um, but so, certainly what, what some of my favorite buildings in the world are in Rome. Um, but Well, it's been a great place to take students, hasn't it? I mean, we, you, you, can, you can do a walk through the centuries. You know, you can start in the ancient world and, and in relatively few streets, you can find yourself passing um, you know, Palazzo Massimo up through Piazza Navona, you can end up at Morpurgo's um, Piazza 
Augusto Imperatore, which is a wonderful, really fantastic example. I mean, we, we, we like to go to the EUR as well, and there's, there is a sensitivity to those buildings, I think, in, in, the, in the constructional detail, which is often lost in the, the, in the you know, the, the, the big, the, the photos of, um, of the kind of bombastic fascist urban scheme. But with Morpurgo, the, there's a project that's beautifully knitted into the um, into the city. Works so well on its in its various faces. is an absolute masterpiece. So it's a city we've uh, taken students to uh, for a couple of years, and would would quite like to take them every year, really. But there's other places to go to, um, and you know Stockholm and Copenhagen loom very large in our inspiration. And places we'd like to go are uh, ret to return to Vienna. To go to Ljubljana to see the work, to see Plechnik's work there, so um, it, it sort of feels that we could constantly draw from Rome, um, but we're often drawn elsewhere. In November field trips, when it's really cold, and we end up wishing we'd just gone to Rome again. <laughs> Happy birthday, Rome! <laughs> Just a, a, a final question, and I, I wanted to echo what Peter said earlier. I thought that last project was uh, very elegant and executed, and hoping that you'll be able to do much more of that. But I'm curious to shift just a quick question to um, some of your work in academia and whether you um, have met great resistance in establishing your recent classical program at Kingston. Uh, and if so, I was just curious to know maybe but some of the leading arguments against it or for it have been. I was wondering if you could share that. Um, I don't think we, I don't think we, um, no, generally we've been very supportive. I think, uh, I, I think the worst we encounter is a kind of amused tolerance, you know, uh, <laughs> sort of um, some colleagues I think are quite happy for us to do what we're doing, but don't really know why we, why, why we are. Um, but on the whole, the, the school's been very supportive. I mean, we were, um, you know, we started we started teaching it because what one year we had we had um, looked very closely at, at Lutchens and um, we described him as a third tutor in, in this particular year. And one of our students um, had produced this piece of work, um, which was sort of mounted up for the end of year show. And our head of school had seen it and said, "Oh, I don't know that building." What is it? And he, he had assumed that it was a, a precedent study. It was actually it was her design, and 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 so so, so you know she said no no it's my it's my design and that um, he he was sort of so pleased with that that he awarded it the head of year prize um, head of school prize, and so we thought well you know if this isn't a, a signal that we could start to teach uh, uh, a sort of more direct kind of classical unit then. Um, you know, we're, we're unlikely to get a better one, um, and so the following year we, you know, we we did, um, and I think we slightly got it slipped it in under the radar because the because the um, the theme of the year that year was legacy, which was intended to deal with the legacy of the Olympic Games, which were happening in London at that that year, um, and we sort of deliberately misinterpreted. Uh, legacy to mean kind of classical legacy, <laughs> um, which obviously also has a link to the Olympic Games. But um, um, so, so, so that was it was a mixture of a mixture of um, sleight of hand, but also also support from from our head of school. And we haven't really had much much um, obstruction at all. We've actually we've had we've had probably more resistance from one or two guest critics. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Tim's, Tim's had a standing up row with them in the pub after after a crit. Um, I mean, a good a good natured one, but um, but but the faculty has been very interesting. And the, thing, the thing is, at Kingston, um, there's a very strong interest among all tutors in architecture and construction, mm -hmm. and I think you know even for those who are, 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 the, are the most sort of hell bent on modernism, there just isn't an architect. There, there isn't an argument against the teaching of classicism if you're interested in architecture and construction uh, you know that the, um, the argument is hollow the moment it's expressed uh, 
they might be more skeptical about our ambitions in practice. But I think as in academia, it, it should be about open-minded exploration. And, and it, it just seems astonishing to us. You know, we're not absolutely not anti-modernist, um, uh, but I think you, uh, students leave as more confident designers, um, knowing a bit more about the orders, how they're applied in a creative way, but also being able to read the cities that are around them. So much work is in retrofit and that sort of thing that um, I think enables enables graduates to uh, to read the city far more confidently. Um, having said that, uh, you know, it, it's usually when I find, you know, personally, when I find myself talking to people from other architecture schools, you know, after a, an exhibition opening or something like that, and I say, oh, yeah, I um, yeah, teach a classical studio, they, you know, you, they're aghast. Um, they are, they're, they're shocked and stunned and think that I'm doing something absolutely heinous. You know, they almost sort of step back with the odor of um, my activities. And I, I just find that really exciting now. Um, it just, it feels kind of radical and essential and just, and, and totally normal at the same time. Well, um, had we not been under the circumstances of COVID, um, maybe we wouldn't have gone to the pub, but we definitely would have <laughs> had a of uh, And I hope that we will have the opportunity in the near future to be able to meet and discuss these uh, topics further. But I want to thank you both uh, for a wonderful presentation and for your dedication to the, the students. I've heard great things about the studio and look forward to seeing the final presentation. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Look forward to Fraser Margarita at some point in Miami. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.